What's going on guys? I'm Tyler, and to continue my series of Studio Ghibli reviews, I'm here to let you know that My Neighbors the Yamadas is no perfect movie. And this film portrays a series of vignettes that portray the daily lives of the Yamada family, played by Jim Belushi, Molly Shannon, Daryl Savara, Liliana Mummy Mamai. I should have looked it up, but I have no idea what else this girl's been in, and Trez McNeil. And it was directed by Isao Takahata, who was not only the most mature filmmaker of Studio Ghibli when it came down to themes and subject matter, but he was also the most diverse filmmaker in regards to different animation styles. Which is fitting, because he wasn't an animator he couldn't draw, so it almost felt like he was experimenting with the craft with every new film that he made. He had traditional, straightforward animation that featured darker brown colors like Engrave of the Fireflies, bright, beautiful watercolor scenery in Pompoco, and some rough but still aesthetically well-made sketches designs in The Tale of Princess Kaguya. With My Neighbors the Yamadas, he creates the first ever and possibly only completely computer-animated Studio Ghibli film to recreate the style of a Yonkoma, which is a manga formatted as a four-panel comic strip because My Neighbors the Yamadas was actually based off of that type of Yonkama. At least, it was originally called My Neighbors the Yamadas, and it got changed to Nono-chan for reasons that I'll get into later on. And what's so interesting about it is that the main characters are always fully detailed in their expressions and their designs. All the women have pupils on their eyes and not much else. All the men have scleras and dotted eyes in order to differentiate certain characters from one another. But what was so interesting is that Sometimes background characters and just backgrounds in general have less color, less facial expressions, and sometimes are completely blank. It's a very refreshing visual style to see on screen, but it also helps you focus on the main characters and their dilemmas. And it actually kind of elevates the visual comedy when it comes down to it, because as you're focusing on these characters, you're noticing so many times that in each shot there are one or two characters who have such a wide, optimistic smile because of the situation they're in, whereas one other character, mainly the dad, is unbelievably pissed off and has a huge frown, his eyes are completely shrunken down, his head is starting to red up, and... Seeing those reactions offset each other in the exact same shot was what made so many sequences unbelievably hilarious. I can't believe I'm saying this, but this might actually be the funniest Studio Ghibli film that I've ever seen. And it, and it really helps that they got an excellent ensemble cast who fit their designs perfectly and creates so many deliberately flawed but still likable characters. Jim Belushi and Molly Shannon feel like a genuine, believable couple. They support each other whenever they come home and say that their jobs haven't been treating them well lately, but they still have a humorous rivalry whenever they're trying to relax and enjoy the spare time that they have in their lives, especially my favorite scene in the entire movie where the husband and wife are fighting over a TV remote in a way that you couldn't even possibly imagine. I'm not going to spoil what it is, but the timing, the reactions, was probably the funniest Studio Ghibli scene that I've ever seen. And Tres McNeil, as expected, steals every scene that she's in, especially because she uses her Mrs. Skinner voice when she's playing the grandmother, and it makes her a lot more, it makes her sound a lot more energetic for her age, but still come off as very insightful. She's trying to pass off wisdom to anyone she could try to reach out to, even a delinquent biker in one frequent scene. But sometimes her wisdom is offset by her otherwise incredibly blunt and sarcastic attitude that makes her deliberately flawed but still likable and enjoyable because she has some of the most, she has some of the funniest lines in the entire movie too. Daryl Sabara, Juni Cortez himself, that's right, can once in a while be a little too obnoxious as the underachieving rebellious middle schooler, but that's not really Sabara's fault, it's the way that he's written and plus... Whenever he acts snooty and ungrateful towards not getting his own way in life, it does make it a lot funnier to laugh at him whenever his parents or his grandma prove him wrong. Even his little sister outsmarts him once in a while, which... About the little sister Nonako, from what I understand, the comic strip used to be called My Neighbors the Yamadas, but when Nonako became such a fan favorite, it turned into Nonochan, and it became a story mainly told from her point of view. So you can imagine my surprise when I say that she's actually given the least amount of screen time and story compared to the rest of the characters. 
which I find really weird, and we'll get more into why I think so later on, but Liliana Mummy, whatever her last name is, does give a very well-earned performance, and she seems like a genuine four- or five-year-old kid who's completely oblivious to the world around her, but she still has an optimistic attitude that she gets from her mother and her grandmother passing on, who pass on wisdom to her. Now, in regards to the story structure, because this movie is mainly a series of vignettes, there's not really a free act structure, which is completely normal for a Studio Ghibli movie, but I find I find My Neighbors the Yamadas to be the most mundane and simplistic, but still tightly written script that Studio Ghibli has put out, at least around that time period. Because My Neighbor Totoro, Kiki's Delivery Service, had free act structures in regards to character development more so than story. With the vignettes in My Neighbors the Yamadas, there is a free act structure with each vignette, and as per usual with Studio Ghibli films, the most consistent thing is the character development. Mainly to address the whole philosophy that every family has its ups and downs. And it's trying to teach us that the most we can do in life often is to accept the fact that there are going to be some problems we can't avoid. But embrace the fact that we have people around you who will be able to support you and look after you. And you can do the exact same for them, vice versa. One of the smartest written vignettes, in my opinion, is where the mother is trying to trick the grandmother into making sushi so that they don't have to order. And then it turns out she tries to make beef stroganoff and then completely fucks up and goes, yeah, sorry, I messed it up. Just order the sushi. It's a great scene that shows that the grandmother can be just as lazy about cooking as much as the mother is lazy about ordering out food or cooking it herself, but it also goes to show that the grandmother is willing to share responsibility throughout the entire family and that the mother is actually very grateful for it. There are so many subtle themes about embracing family and parenthood and accepting that there are just as many flaws as there are strengths. If anything, the majority of the movie is mainly about the flaws and why we make them in the first place. And one of the other smart scenes that's actually early on in the film where the father is trying to teach the son about how discipline can really motivate you as a person and can shape you into the person you are. And it really goes to show that kids either learn these lessons right away, like with the, like with the daughter or with the son, where they only learn these lessons after they make mistakes. Like when this kid tries to study for school, but he keeps falling asleep. And then once he fucks up his exams, he goes studying night and day to the point where the parents don't want to be around him so that they don't distract him. It's a great example of how mistakes in life are absolutely necessary. Mistakes in life are things that we wish we can get rid of. In fact, nowadays we're wishing that any mistake can go away. But this movie is here to say no matter what you do, shit's going to happen. And there's nothing you can do about it other than ask other people for help, ask them to change their ways, and once they make mistakes, they'll be able to change themselves and they'll be able to help change you. Now, the only downfall, in my opinion, with My Neighbors the Yamadas is that the adults get a lot more development and a lot more clever comedy than the kids do, and I wouldn't have even guessed that because the first five minutes are the little girl, Nanako, introducing the entire family from her perspective, and when you see her, she's the character that stands out the most in the family because of how large her pupils are, it's basically to make her look very cutesy, and she's incredibly effective at that. And one thing that I also notice is that when you do get her side of the story, she has the least amount of flaws in regards to the other characters, and that might be because of her young age and how oblivious she is to everything else, but at the same time, wouldn't you want a role model character like her or Prince Ashitaka to spend more time with these characters and offer a straightforward explanation that these characters are looking for whenever they're trying to remember to do their chores, remember to help other people out and stuff like that? I get that she's a younger kid and she doesn't know any better, but sometimes younger kids are the most effective characters in Studio Ghibli films or even animated films in particular. May from My Neighbor Totoro was the most interesting character in my opinion because she was so wide-eyed and curious and the movie was so good at portraying her perspective in the vein of a four-year-old and making us feel just excited like we're a kid again. There aren't that many Studio Ghibli movies that I can safely say are underrated, but in my opinion, My Neighbors the Yamadas might be the most underrated Studio Ghibli film. 
My favorite as I'm doing this series right now is when Marnie was there, but there are plenty of people who love it just as much, if not maybe a little less than I do. I can acknowledge that. But with My Neighbors the Yamadas, it didn't even make that much money in Japan, let alone overseas, which kind of makes sense. I mean, you... Your last film was Princess Mononoke, a movie with large scales, great action sequences, some really well-fleshed-out characters, and fleshed-out immature themes. And then you start off again with a light-hearted comedy made by the guy who directed Grave of the Fireflies, which, by the way, Isao Takahata, as fucked up as his stories were, dude might have actually been the best at comedy in regards to Studio Ghibli movies, but I keep getting off track. I think that this movie is the most underrated because the characters are well fleshed out in a slice of life manner, similar to Totoro and Kiki. The animation, while it is very simplistic, is incredibly stylistic too. It still moves at a fast and fluid pace like any other Ghibli flick. The actors suit their designs and the characters' personalities very nicely. And the mature themes of how mistakes in life are inevitable and you have to get used to it in order to learn from them in order to become stronger it just shows that Takahata is able to is able to make a lighthearted movie without sacrificing his moral principles in regards to storytelling. So for all those reasons, I'm going to give My Neighbors the Yamadas a 4 out of 5. Guys, thanks as always for watching. If you have seen My Neighbors the Yamadas, I'm very curious. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of it. Be sure to stay tuned for more Studio Ghibli reviews. If you've followed through on the filmography, you know that Spirited Away is going to play tomorrow. So look forward to that. And be sure to like and subscribe. Take care.